Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Smaha and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you so much for joining us today for an exciting conversation with our amazing panel of scientists. Whether you are a beginning birder or have decades of experience, we hope that this uh, webinar will be very fun and informative for you. For over 50 years, Manomet has been a leader in bird research and conservation. We use science and collaboration to strengthen flyways, coastal ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, working lands and seas across the Western Hemisphere. We do this work with many partners to help nature and local communities thrive. Before we get started today, I have a couple of things to share. First, we're going to get started by asking our panelists to give you all a brief introduction of themselves and tell you a little bit about their role here at Manomet and tell you a little bit about the image that you see in their background. Then we're going to get right into your questions. We're going to try and get through as many of your questions today as possible. If you have a question for our panelists, please enter it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see a Q&A box right now, please just hover your mouse pointer over the bottom of your Zoom screen and it should pop up. Finally, if you can't stay for the entirety of today's presentation, we are recording and we will be emailing you a link uh, within 24 hours of today's presentation. Thank you again so much for joining us and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alan to give you all a brief introduction of himself, his role here at Manomet. And um, unfortunately, uh, Alan's background wasn't working today, but uh, he's going to introduce us to one of the birds that he loves. All right, hello everybody. My name is Alan Nidal and I'm a staff biologist at Manomet. Um, at Manomet, I participate in a variety of science initiatives and currently spend a lot of time uh, advancing Wimbrel conservation goals in the Atlantic Flyway and expanding those efforts into the Gulf Coast this spring, which I'm very excited about. In addition to that, I'm helping um, begin new work with Red Knots out on Cape Cod, um, continuing some of the work that Brian Harrington began in the previous decades, and also participate in managing science operations at Manomet's headquarters, Manomet Observatory in the town of Manomet. The bird I would like to discuss with you all briefly is the Eastern Phoebe, which in addition to being my favorite bird is also a bird that is primed for this time of year. Um, I'm looking here, my first Eastern Phoebe here in Providence, Rhode Island, where I'm living, I saw on March 27th this year, and that's about right on time when they first start showing up here in New England. And at Manomet Observatory, they often show up in that last week of March, and it's always one of the first signs of true spring and kind of coincides with the American toads and the spring peepers and the first leaf out of some early plants. And in addition to being that harbinger of spring, they also have so many fun little quirks of their biology, whether it's their wagging tail or their habit of nesting underneath bridges and uh, saddling out for bugs well into October when a lot of the other fly catchers have left. And um, I'm sure many of you have seen Phoebes and are starting to see them in your backyards and popping up, but I'd be happy to talk more about Phoebes later on, but that's my intro and I'll pass it on to Arne, I believe. Yes, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Arne Lesterhaus. Uh, I was born and raised in Holland, but work in Paraguay since 2000, so over two decades now. I'm a showbird monitoring and conservation specialist at Manomet, and a great part of my work here is coordinating projects and programs that uh, focus on shorebird monitoring and identifying key sites for shorebirds based on the gathered data. So, so monitoring is basically counting. And for as long as I can remember, I've been counting birds. So whenever we were on the road visiting family, for example, I would be sitting in the car with a notebook counting the birds I saw along the road or wherever we were really. And when you are, when you are into birds, uh, of course you will get in touch with, with migration. I mean, that's a given. And there are just so many birds that migrate that I think nearly half of all known birds probably. Uh, I saw a figure a while back, like 4,000 birds that migrate, which is quite a lot. And they basically migrate everywhere in, in, in many, many directions. So that's north, south, up and down, east, west, you can, you can name it. And some of them escape the, the, the bad weather and, and others just follow where, wherever the food is. 
it's quite uh, extreme, uh, extremely diverse, really. So in Holland, when I when I lived there, I was mainly familiar with with the north south migrations. I mean, birds coming through Europe and going to Africa. But when I came to Paraguay, I actually got in touch with a different migration system, which the which is the austral migration system. So austral migration is basically the opposite of the Arctic migration. Uh, but it, is, it, it has also several uh, different patterns, actually. And Paraguay is a great spot to get confused, really. So we have austral migrants here that only arrive during the winter. But we also have austral migrants that only breed here and then move north, leaving the country. And then we have birds that we think are, uh, or we, we, you could think that they are resident, but actually are birds that breed here, then move, and we got the same species coming from the south moving in. So they are actually not uh, residents, they're just switching populations. Uh, so, so birds and local breeders are replaced by other birds. So that's really pretty interesting, but uh, also quite confusing at times. So further south in South America, it's, 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 it's less confusing and austral migrants basically only move north during winter, leaving their breeding grounds to escape the cold. So here on this side, I think I can't see myself now. There's a good example, uh, which is the tawny throated dodderall. That's a very attractive plover, of, uh, which I like very much. And you can see it here behind me. It is an, an austral migrant. Uh, which basically does the same migration as neotic migrants, uh, but uh, like I mentioned earlier, in opposite direction. So during the austral summer, it breeds uh, all the way down in Patagonia. And then when it's getting colder there, it will move up. And sometimes almost, almost <laughs> reaching Paraguay, but so far not documented here, unfortunately. But uh, thanks to work uh, and projects we have in the south, I've seen it over there. So if you have any questions about austral migration or any of the the, the species that are down here, then I'm open for and to answer them. Sorry, uh, Karis. Hi, my name is Karis Rittenauer. I'm a conservation biologist here at Manomet. I am uh, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and my primary focus right now is a conservation initiative uh, in partnership with Natural Resources Conservation Services, or NRCS. Uh, we are working with and partnering with local landowners and farmers to perform shorebird-friendly management practices post-harvest to provide habitat for, uh, stopover habitat for fall migration, fall migratory shorebirds uh, on farms here in Louisiana. Um, and uh, we can get more into this later, but I uh, thought that it was interesting listening to Arne talk about all the different ways that birds migrate uh, through uh, where he is, because it, I have a very similar uh, time here in Louisiana. I grew up in Minnesota, and we got birds in the, in the uh, summer and they left in the winter. And here in Louisiana, we have birds that winter here. We have birds that summer here. We have birds that migrate through on their way further south. Uh, so it's a, it's a totally different ball game in terms, <laughs> in terms of birding down here. Um, but speaking of Louisiana, these are uh, baby brown pelicans, um, which is the state bird of Louisiana. It's also the one of the species that I did my master's uh, research on. I went to the uh, Louisiana State University, graduated in 2019, and uh, my research was on factors affecting nest success of colonial nesting waterbirds in southwest Louisiana, including brown pelicans, uh, uh, tricolored herons, forster's terns, and roseate spoonbills. Uh, so I got to get up close and personal with uh, breeding and um, nesting and baby birds um, of all different types in southwest Louisiana. It was a really, really amazing experience. So uh, those are the birds I wanted to share today. Um, Marcella, I think you're next. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcela Castellino. I'm from Argentina. I'm located in Miramar de Ancenusa. I was born and raised here. Is a small town in Córdoba province, 
almost in the middle of the country and is in the shores of a, one of the biggest saline lakes in the world, that is Mar Chiquita Wetland or Mar Chiquita Lake. And the picture that I have in my background is uh, one from this site. Um, and the bear that I want to share with you um, is the Wilson Falarop. I have been working with the species for over 10 years. And as part of the management staff, I'm working on the conservation of saline lakes as a conservation specialist. And we are trying to um, understand a little more about the distribution and habitat use of the species in South America. And um, also here we are uh, working to improve the um, supporting the, the um, uh, protection of the area because this is one of the most important uh, wintering sites for the species. And now I'm entering into the autumn. So I'm saying goodbye to the phalaropes. I'm not longer seeing the phalaropes here, but I'm saying welcome to, I'm, I'm saying welcome to the, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, the tawny throat daughter, the army is in the background of the screen. So we have shorebirds all year round here. And I will happy to answer any question that you might have, if I can, about the side of the species. Gracias, Marcela. I'll take over. Um, and we'll be looking for your fallow ropes as they head north very soon, are we? I'm Trevor Lloyd Evans. I guess technically I am the Vice President for Environmental Education and Outreach, but I've been at Manomet for a very long time. Well, my first title was Director of Land Bird Conservation Programs, and uh, that was really what got me over here. And when I joined in the 1970s, it was a Manomet Bird Observatory, so we were uh, not, quite as, not quite as ecumenical as we are nowadays. I never really had a chance with birding. I think I was an only child and was taken up by my parents who were deeply involved in, uh, in birding and ornithology, bird watching as we called it in the old country. I come from Britain originally, a Welsh background. And uh, so I was just taken out looking for birds, looking for plants, looking for land and freshwater mollusks, whatever other exciting things my parents were doing. And that stuck with me. So that really started me off on a zoology career. I went to the University of Wales um, at Colleague Professor Abertawi, as we say, at Swansea. And that was, that was my degree in, in zoology. But then my basic training was at a, a wonderful location where I started to get into bird ringing or bird banding. And uh, that really helps because that's kind of what I do now. Um, so the bird ringing was at Rye Mead's Sewerage Purification Works, which is pretty much what it sounds like. By the time the, the river from uh, the River Lee goes through the River Thames and gets down to London, it's been through tertiary treatment about 10 times, I think. And each time the water comes out very purely and creates wonderful lagoons. So as bird watchers, where would you go? You'd go down to these freshwater lagoons and all sorts of exciting things would happen there. And I met a bird ringing group and uh, learned there. Basic training at various bird observatories in Britain, especially uh, Bardsey Island off the coast of Wales. And then like everybody else, follow the migrant birds. So I've been lucky enough to travel down with fall migration, the same sort of birds Arnie was, uh, was talking about. Although in the Netherlands, he would have had a, a wider variety of birds because I lived on a funny little offshore island and we always get fewer species on offshore islands. But that makes it more exciting when the, the odd Dutch bird, like a ruff, comes over and we all rush over and see it, check it off on our bird list. Very exciting. Now they're breeding there, incidentally, as the climate warms. And uh, so I followed the birds down to Spain and Portugal, did a lot of work there on migrants down into uh, Lake Chad in Africa on occasion. And then had a chance to come over to a new bird observatory con uh, sort of uh, theory in, uh, in, in Massachusetts, southeastern Massachusetts. Kathleen Anderson, our first director, invited me over again with Brian Harrington, the shorebird guy, and we both arrived in the 70s and pretty much been here ever since, but having an amazing variety of things going on. Particularly, um, I'll just say that I've been in charge of the, the land bird migration program, which started in 1966 
but it was really 1970 through the current vending season where we catch birds in mist nets, migrant birds, spring and fall. And uh, that has provided us with an amazing ability to use birds, I guess, as environmental indicators and also to have a wonderful time handling them. So that's sort of brief potted history. Back to you, Danielle, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. We've already started to get some questions coming in, uh, especially based off your introductions. So the first question is for Alan. Uh, do Phoebes come back to the same area? Uh, this question is from Barbara Sari. We had one last year and we have another one this year. And do they nest in house? Well, that's a great question. Oh, does anyone hear that? <laughs> Just in case you don't know what a Phoebe sounds like. Um, so that's a great question. And I do have an answer for you. So, and actually someone way back in 1803 actually asked the same question, a fellow by the name of John James Audubon. As story tells, he actually tied some silver thread to two of his young Phoebe that hatched outside of his house to see whether they would come back the next year. And he actually saw that one return the next year with some silver thread still on his leg. And as the story goes, that is the first official bird banding that occurred in North America. But in more recent times, we at Manomet band Phoebes quite regularly and they will frequently return banded the following spring, including often the first Phoebe that shows up in Manomet's garden is a banded bird that's returning back to its territory after wintering somewhere further south. And so I would say there's a good chance that the bird that's coming back to your yard is a returning bird that bred there last year, either the male or the female, likely both members of the pair could return if they survived the previous year. And one of the coolest things about Phoebes is that they have the habit of nesting on man-made structures, whether it's their absolute favorite is, I would say would be a footbridge over a running stream that's maybe a 10 foot wide stream and they'll nest on the ledge underneath the bridge, but they'll also nest underneath the eaves of a house, um, underneath the, the eaves of the tea house in Manaman's garden they've nested. And they actually design, instead of a bird box, they actually design, there's bird ledges that are made like a bird box, but it's just open with a little platform that you can actually attach to the side of your house to create a little nest for a Phoebe or a nest platform for a Phoebe. So, they're very good neighbor companions. And if they could get in your house, they probably would try. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Karis, um, uh, we have a follow-up question for you. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, how you're working with farmers and shorebirds in Louisiana? Yeah, absolutely. Um, farming in Louisiana is very different, well, some of it is very different from uh, most of the rest of the country. So um, part of why we are working, we are able to work so closely with farmers in Louisiana is because two of our main crops here are rice and crawfish. Um, yes, crawfish is considered a crop rather than aquaculture. Um, and they're often grown together and both crops require managing water levels on the field in a very similar way to the way that water is, water levels are managed in uh, wildlife management areas and other uh, protected wetland areas. Um, it's a very similar structure. And so in the springtime when rice is just beginning to germinate and water has just been put on the field, that is a really wonderful resource for spring migrants, uh, all kinds of different shorebirds are able to stop and take advantage of the shallow water uh, across the landscape and the abundant invertebrates uh, within that farming structure. And, however, in the fall, water has already been removed from the landscape for both crawfish farms and uh, rice uh, in order to harvest. And uh, for some of, the, some of the shorebird migration period, if it's a rice field, uh, the rice will be much too tall for shorebirds to be interested in. But later in the fall, uh, usually rice or crawfish have already been harvested and fields are left dry. 
Um, and so we are partnering with farmers to harness that unutilized landscape during the fall to uh, encourage them to collect, passively collect rainwater uh, to create mudflat and shallow water habitats that can expand the ability of shorebirds to uh, have safe places to stop and eat, stop and rest uh, on their migration down to South America. Excellent. Thank you, Karis. And Trevor, a question's come in for you from Doug Helmers. How many birds have you banded at Manoet and what is your oldest recapture? My old friend, Doug Helmers. Well, fancy that. Um, thinking this might come up and let's just deal with the birds that are migrating through. So our main migration studies in spring and fall. The answer, Doug, is 262,324 as of the end of last season. Um, so, yeah, we banded about 80,000, 87,000 in the spring, about 175,000 in the fall. And of course, the, the reason for putting bands on birds, um, it's fun to have a bird in your hand. It's wonderful. It's exciting to know whether that Phoebe back under the garden house roof is the same Phoebe. And I think we've had some Phoebes that might have been five, six years old, which is pretty old for a small bird. Um, yeah, when people ask about the oldest bird, I, I usually think of actually sort of on a different hat, working with the Boston Globe. Some, some old porter wanted to go see birds in the middle of the summer. And of course, we were not banding birds because we took our nets down in the summer, give the birds a break and let them breathe. So we went down Plymouth Beach, local shorebird place and the local tern colony. And there was an Arctic tern, which I picked up from a colony. It's one of their southernmost breeding Arctic terns. Mostly they're just common terns at that colony there. And a band had been placed on it by somebody called Oliver Austin Sr. 26 years before. So that bird had been traveling from the Long Beach in Plymouth down to at least the tip of, uh, sort of uh, Argentina and possibly out south of Tierra del Fuego and possibly down to, uh, to the low, backwards and forwards. So heaven knows how many miles, quarter million miles, something like that, just to and fro every year. So that I guess counts as our oldest bird, Doug. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So Arnie, a question has come in for you. Uh, are there any bird ecotours or guides in Paraguay that you might recommend? Oh, that's actually a good question because sometimes people tend to over, overlook Paraguay actually for, for birding. Uh, but as I just have talked about migration here, which is already pretty interesting and confusing at the same time, it also has, um, it, it has a lot of, um, good habitat types here like Atlantic Forest and you have the Chaco and you have Cerrado which is grassland so and it's all pretty close by so instead of going to one of the neighboring countries you could definitely do a great trip to Paraguay and there are some good birding tour companies actually who can who can provide that so so yes it's definitely um I can I can put a link uh, later on uh, where you can look into that excellent thank you so much uh, Alan, a question for you and anybody else feel free to weigh in as well, but uh, could you give us an update on the status of red knot populations? Sure. Um, I'm assuming you're asking about the, the Rufa subspecies of red knot, which is um, the North American subspecies that migrates uh, down the Atlantic coast. Um, I'll give you both a Massachusetts-centric answer and a hemispheric answer. I think the latest estimation for the Rufa subspecies is around 57,000 roughly. And that's broken down with about 30,000 wintering on the north coast of South America and then smaller numbers. And on the southeast coast, the coast of Gulf, Gulf of Mexico and then the Caribbean. And interestingly, Manomet is currently proposing new research on the north coast of South America in tandem with New Jersey Audubon and other organizations to explore a new region of the coastline there that was flown uh, by David Mizrahi in 2020. And he located a new area that could be concentrating large numbers of red knots and could be of interest in 
uh, new conservation initiatives locally there. Um, within Massachusetts, as many of you probably know, Brian Harrington's been monitoring red pop, red knot numbers out on Cape Cod and in eastern Massachusetts for several decades. And during that period, they've abandoned several sites that they've used to use, such as Third Cliff and Situate that back in the 70s had several thousand birds visiting during the fall. And now the most, uh, the most knots you can find are in the Monomoy Pleasant Bay area of southeastern Cape Cod. And currently, Brian estimates there's between one to 2,000 total red knots passing through there in the fall, which is down from even just 10 years ago when there was about 5,000. And one of our current research interests is figuring out the causes of those declines and also some observed shifts we're seeing and the shifts in abundance within that system northward and exploring whether that's being caused by changes and their prey resources. And but so overall declining numbers within Massachusetts and big declines over the last century. And but new developments and new research going on to try to figure out these important sites and what's uh, driving the fluctuations there. And Manamet is very excited to be a part of that. Excellent. Um, so I have a question I'm gonna throw out uh, to all of you. So whoever feels most comfortable, are shorebirds being hunted anywhere along the Atlantic flyway? Uh, well, I can, I can say a little bit about it, um, but yeah, in short, they are. <laughs> so <laughs> I have been looking at, into that in, for, for a while now to see uh, where and, and to what extent, but, but yeah, they do still in Suriname, for example, they do still along parts of the coast in Brazil. The, the Guyanas in general, actually, although sometimes they, what I hear that, for example, in Suriname, people are indeed hunting shorebirds, but they also say that they have people coming over from, from Guyana the, to hunt them there because they can't in Guyana itself. So there is that kind of movement going on. And, and, and the Caribbean, I mean, the Caribbean have some, uh, some islands have these, these shooting swamps where people can pay to, to shoot uh, shorebirds. Um, yeah, it's not really... You could say it's a type of sustainable <laughs> hunting, but it's just it's a shooting swamp. That's what it is, and people come there to shoot birds. So it's really a trap for birds. Uh, but I mean, they're starting to work on on that to to reduce that. But yeah, it's, it's still it's it is still an issue for for several uh, bird species that. And I mean, we know that a uh, several species of shorebird, like Eskimo curly, uh, but also buff-breasted sandpiper, are birds that suffered uh, a lot from. Uh, from hunting and so it's still something to really keep in mind and try to reduce. Yeah. Thank you, Arnie. Um, I have another question uh, for all of you. Uh, so there has been increased public support for environmental protection policies. And I think um, it'd be interesting to hear from those of you in South America, if you feel like that tracks um, throughout the hemisphere as well. But have you found it easier lately to get funding for any bird conservation projects? Uh, maybe I can share a little. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, we conservation uh, is always um, a priority for us, but it's not every time very easy to find support. Um, but here we are. At, at least I can talk for my side in Mar Chiquita, we have a very positive situation right now. We are uh, working in the um, declaration of a national park. We are supporting the process and there is, luckily we have the support for uh, make shorebird surveys and monitoring and working the education and outreach. And um, we are working with several partners, local partners here. So the situation here is like, um, at least for now is very positive is, um, yeah, I think that uh, something that I can share. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everyone agree with me, but it's, yeah. <laughs> In South America, it's, I mean, there can be some challenges, but it's, yeah, we can work in conservation and we can find support. 
Excellent. Trevor Allen, do you have any perspectives to share from what you're seeing here in North America? Well, I've been around longest, so um, I do have a perspective on it, I guess. And sure, um, we have always, with just bird banding, been working on a, a, an international scheme. The bird banding office is actually a joint Canadian and uh, United States office. I think there are hopes that Mexico can be involved in that and it will spread out for the time being. Um, but Manomet being a small organization has always worked closely with all sorts of folks. And uh, some, of the, some of the best partnerships, as I'm sure our Sherbert colleagues would agree, have been with US Fish and Wildlife, Canadian Wildlife Service in the north up here. And um, that, that has, really, has really provided um, you know, an ability for the government to get more people into places that are hard to get to without having to pay a whole lot of government workers and for nonprofit folks like us to get to places we couldn't get to. And then as we begin to work with some of our more international programs like the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Program or the International Shorebird Survey, just to move back to shorebirds for a minute, that has now become international over the whole uh, the whole Western Hemisphere. And so we've been getting more support. Um, I think conservation organizations as a whole that have members who just like birds and just appreciate conservation are doing their best. And a lot of Manomet's work is, is aimed at educating folks. And I think if we can all pass on our conservation message to our friends and the school kids and the university students, then that really, that really is uh, an improving situation. Even as the birds are declining, I think the interest is increasing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I have a big picture question for uh, any of you. How has COVID-19 impacted your research that you're doing today? Um, well, I can uh, start. My, my work is uh, a little bit less research focused and a little bit more uh, programmatic and um, conservation focused uh, and actually producing conservation on the ground uh, rather than uh, the more of the research area. But COVID-19 really derailed uh, our project. A lot of, a lot of what my, um, my work is, is getting out into the field, meeting with producers, farmers, landowners. Um, and obviously that kind of came to a stop um, this last year. Um, so much of what Manomet does uh, all over, um, everywhere we work, is working with partners on the ground. And uh, I know that uh, varying different levels uh, of, uh, you know, response to COVID in different areas. I'll, I'll let uh, the folks from South America talk a little bit about um, their restrictions, which in some cases I think were uh, even more re uh, restrictive than uh, what we had here in the U.S. Um, I know that that has sort of uh, slowed down uh, some of our ability to work, but I've I've also been really impressed, um, sort of across the board, at, at what people have been able to get done despite it. And it has also opened some new interesting opportunities. Uh, Abby Sterling, who is not on this call, um, produced some research. Uh, over the last year, uh, looking at the impacts of having no one on the beach in Georgia um, and how that affected the birds that were nesting there that would normally have had, you know, beachgoers, uh, people with dogs, bikes, all sorts of things to deal with, and they got a year without it. And so that was a really interesting uh, research op opportunity that came uh, out of uh, this pandemic. And so um, yeah, it has definitely been difficult, but there have been uh, bright spots as well. Thank you. Anybody else want to talk about kind of how COVID-19 has affected their work? Yeah, I, I can share a little if you uh -huh. want from Argentina. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Uh, yeah, definitely was a challenging year for everybody. 
and we have to adapt to the restrictions and the situation. Last year, we have here in my country, we have um, almost a complete lockdown. I mean, uh, we weren't able to move and travel and only groceries and basic stuff for several months. And in a big area like Mar Chiquita, that can be a problem because we work, as Kari said, we work with partners and we work uh, on, ter on territory. And also we have been doing um, surveys here. So we need, we, we conduct aerial surveys, for example, we need the plane and the pilot and so we need to travel to get to other cities. Mar Chiquita has uh, 600,000 hectares. So it's a very big uh, site. So logistics definitely was challenging, but I also agree that um, I'm I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm amazed how much people can achieve. We, we try to uh, adapt to the situation. We switch everything that we can and we try to arrange the agenda. And um, luckily here for the summer season, the restrictions were less. So we were able to go to the field and monitoring the, the Nordic migrants. But yeah, it was it was definitely challenging, and I think it will be still for a while. Thank you so much. Um, I have another kind of big picture question, and I'll look to you, Trevor, to answer this first, uh, due to your long experience in the Banning Lab. But can you talk a little bit about what effects you've seen from climate change upon bird migration, or on the flip side, how? the data that you've collected provides evidence for climate change? Yes, that sort of takes us back to, uh, to the, the long-term approach. I mean, luckily, the, the people who started off the, the land bird banding and the, the shorebird counts and so on, at and I met back in the 70s, the banders, all of the volunteers, we really had no idea that climate change was going to be something important. We did know that birds are extremely um, volatile and extremely accurate environmental indicators. I've said this before, but it sort of bears repeating. And so if birds don't like a situation, they vote with their wings and they disappear rapidly. If earthworms don't like a situation, there isn't a whole lot an earthworm can do about it. And I'm sorry to say not too many people care except gardens, but people care about birds. And so that gives us a, an amazing ability. So yeah, we, we collected information um, on the number of uh, bird populations passing through Maname, passing up the Eastern Flyway. That turned out to correlate really well with breeding bird surveys. So yes, what we're getting is a, a true sample of what was really passing by. and. From 1970 through to 1995, we have a 2% per year decline in the number of migrant birds passing through both spring and fall. Probably most of our listeners have heard about the we've lost 3 billion birds out of 10 billion. And unfortunately, that fits in pretty well with what we've seen in those first, uh, from 1970 to 1995. Um, we found a decline in just the overall number of birds of 54%. Now, the good news is from 1995 through the end of last year, um, the trends for, for land birds passing through Manomet, and most of these, at least half of them are near tropical migrants, and most of them are migrants um, who may even winter in the southern US, but the uh, Caribbean, but some of them go right on down. And we found that there is no significant difference from zero in the population trend since 1995. So, you know, good news, maybe we're doing some sort of conservation things well. The other part of climate change that we all know about is the warming, at least in the northern hemispheres. And uh, I've had the privilege of working in the Arctic with some of Stephen Brown and other projects up there. And the, the, the warming is amazing up there. We're just seeing the ice disappear every time we go up in the summer. Um, so what we are finding is that many of these neotropical migrant birds that pass through Manomet are arriving back earlier because they're responding to warmer climate and therefore an earlier bud burst, earlier leaf out. Once the leaves come out, it's a, it's a battle between the, the leaf to expand as greatly as it can and then bring in the tannins if you're an oak tree to stop the insects from eating you or the insects to hatch out at the best time and eat the leaf before it gets the tannins. And of course, those insects are what our migrants are feeding on as they head northwards. So yes, we've seen, we've seen earlier arrivals, we've seen birds adapting very quickly. And again, just coming back to that 
mantra. These birds are, are really good environment indicators. And many of the southern species, or anyone who's been looking at birds for 50 plus years, um, will find that the, you know, the Carolina wrens and the red-bellied woodpeckers, and even the mockingbirds and the tip mice and the house finches were all very rare in, in New England at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And now they've spread on up. And so many of the permanent residents are also increasing and moving northwards. So yeah, we've seen, we've seen a number of trends like that, which we had no idea would be in a position to document, but I think it shows the value of, uh, of long-term data. Even if you don't quite know why you're collecting it initially, there you go. Excellent, thank you, Trevor. Uh, Arnie, would you like to share anything about how uh, shorebirds and climate change are, or shorebirds are affected by climate change? Yeah, so am I on, yeah, okay, I, I unmuted myself. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so, so I'm not a, a big expert on that. What I do know is, is that like Manomet is, is, is organizing and, and, and uh, coordinating the International Shorebird Survey ever since the, the, the 70s when Trevor started as well. Um, that's a long-term monitoring program on shorebirds. And, and they have been starting to look into this kind of data, although I, I, there hasn't there haven't been published too much on this just yet. But they did see, if I recall correctly, that for some shorebirds there there were differences in an arrival of, of shorebirds as well. But what may what maybe is, is more or what can be more a problem is is mismatching of of when they arrive at their their key sites if if the, the site is not ready for them. That can be a big problem for, for shorebirds and other birds. I mean, we have seen uh, in, in a site just here in, in, in Paraguay, which is not uh, affected by climate change, not that we know of, but it was affected by man. But you can see how that affects bird uh, abundance and densities, especially shorebirds. I mean, a site changes and it affects the population directly. And you can hope that they find another spot. But at some point, if, if many sites like that start to change, in addition to what we do, also changed as a, as a, as a, a result of, of climate change, which can be much, much greater at the effects, then, then that will be a big, big problem. And, and if you see how that climate change in like 50 years can um, um, eliminate big coastal areas, then that, yeah, that might be a big impact on birds. But then again, the, this is stuff we need to, to focus on still and, and learn much more about, but you can expect that it has its effects and that it needs to be addressed. Excellent. Trevor? If I could just add a little bit to that, if we look further into the future, Ani, then of course we're looking at drying climates in many parts of the, uh, of the, of the world, not just, uh, not just North and Central and South America, but uh, drying climates and lowering water levels and then sea level rise, again, removing a lot of the shorebird habitat along the shores. So unfortunately, shorebirds are going to be more and more significant and sensitive indicators to some of these factors as we move forward. Marcella. Yeah, I just want to point it out that is uh, not only on the shores, it's also a problem with saline lakes, inland saline lakes and the water that is um, the the climate change is like um, also uh, a problem uh, related to the, um, I'm trying to find the words, I'm sorry, <laughs> the water management, you know, when the, the lakes are not getting enough water because we are taking the water for uh, industrial or, or um, human uh, activities or population and things like that. And climate change is uh, making that more serious. So I just want to add that. Thank you, that was a great discussion. Uh, I'm gonna answer some of our more targeted or tackle some of our more targeted questions now. Um, so we have a question that came in about the Carolina wren and Alan, maybe you wanna jump on this. How far north do they go when they migrate? <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. And it ties in directly to what everyone was just discussing. Um, in short, Carolina wrens are very non-migratory. If you take an individual nesting pair of Carolina wrens, they are maybe the most sedentary of any of the songbirds um, in the eastern United States, and that they're likely to live their entire lives within a few square miles of where they were born and nesting. But over the last 
half century, they have been slowly inching their range northward as the climate gets a little bit warmer, particularly the winters get a little more mild. But if you look at the Manomets banding data, for example, and if anyone who lives in New England recalls the winter of 2014, 2015, when it was the snowmageddon, so to speak, and there was, I was thankfully not living here yet, but there were several very huge blizzards one after another during late winter. That was, that events like that are very difficult for Carolina wrens to survive because they're foraging in the understory and on the ground and they can handle cold temperatures pretty well, but that much snow cover actually kills off Carolina wrens here on the northern edge of their range. And we actually saw that phenomenon play out in the banding data where for the year after that, there was really no Carolina wrens on Manowitz property, whereas usually they're one of the most common sounds on the property is the, the cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger of the Carolina wren and the psh, 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 and it's a constant soundscape of the Carolina wren. But we banded no Carolina wrens basically the next year and then there's been a slow rebound back to basically the carrying capacity of Manowitz property, which is probably three or four pairs of Carolina wrens. And now they're back to that equilibrium that they're at before that snow event. And I think that probably plays out throughout the northern edge of their range. And as winters become more mild and, and inhospitable winters might become less frequent, or maybe they become more frequent with more volatile winters, who knows. But as long as there's big snow events like that, the wren's population is gonna be very um, fluctuating along that northern edge. But also the individual Carolina wren does not really migrate at all unlike the house wren. The house wren kind of arrives similar to the Eastern Phoebe, you know, the first week in April or so, they, the house wren shows up and the winter wren spends the winter here and then moves northward. But the Carolina wren is very sedentary. Thank you. Uh, Marcel, I have a question for you. Uh, this season in Northeastern Santa Cruz, Argentina, more than 10,000 Wilson's phalaropes were seen. Even though the numbers varied over time, it was never under 1,000 individuals. It's allegedly the main wintering site for species in the state. And um, Emmanuel Tiberi just wanted to know if you knew of this place as it is surrounded by a city called Caleta Olivia. Well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we know we are working in compiling data and, and extended surveys for Wilson's Valero because uh, not long ago, we didn't know, knew much about the distribution and the habitat use here in South America. And we find that Patagonia actually holds uh, bigger numbers than we saw. Um, and I have some records from the area, from Caleta Olivia, but not for last, uh, this last season. So I will be very interested in talking to Emmanuel because this last season, due to COVID pandemic, we couldn't make like a very big effort and we actually conducted a survey, but it was only in 15 key sites in the wintering grounds, in the, according to the abundance and the historic counts, we prioritized those sites. So, but yeah, Patagonia has uh, high numbers uh, of phalaropes occasionally. So it will be interesting to learn more about that. I can't. Uh, I have a fun question uh, that any one of you can tackle. Uh, what bird behavior have you observed that surprised you? Well, one of my jobs when I was training as a bird ringer was to go and stick my hand into holes and look for things and record. It was one of the first breeding bred atlases in Britain. So I was a young lad rushing around sticking my hand into things. And so, you know, found the usual thing, carefully opening up a bird box and finding a flying squirrel come shooting out past you. That happens occasionally. Finding a hornet's nest, not so good. Um, and the one that I really remember was that there is a, a strange woodpecker-like bird in Europe called the Rhinex, which has the most amazing head movements backwards and forwards, looks almost like a snake. And they, uh, they, they feed mainly on ants, and they're very rare in Scotland. In fact, not supposed to be breeding there. But lo and behold, I saw something disappear into a hole, sitting outside and eating my sandwiches and waiting for about an hour. And then finally, out came a rhinox. I was all excited. 
Um, what I didn't know was that when you block the hole by trying to peer into it or sticking a finger in to see what's in there, they're quite small birds, so you can't get a hand in. Um, they sound exactly like a nest of snakes. And you can believe I shot backwards from that tree pretty quickly and then realized, ah, no, okay, there are no snakes up here. Well, actually there are, but they're not in trees. So after that little debate, I went back and stuck my fingers in again and found a nest full of rhinex, which was one of the first records for about 20 years in Scotland. So surprises all around. I could actually, uh, what, what I thought interesting, um, I haven't seen, by the way, the rhinex, which is, I'm not sure why you bring it up, Trevor, because that's one I still need. And when 20 years in Holland, then no, never got that one. Anyway, you always need a bird to go back to. But, um, but what I thought interesting, actually, everybody knows that birds attack their own image in mirrors and in windows, which everybody knows that. But what, what surprised me was ones that when I was in the middle of nowhere here in Paraguay, uh, I parked my car somewhere in the woods, like off road, completely off road. And then I just went birding. And when I come, came back, there was like a golden winged cacique fighting with his own image in my, my mirror. And I was like, how, why would he do that? I mean, it's like he knew cars. I mean, it was really, I mean, I would think that that's something for birds that are like in urban areas or something, because they get a lot of, of, of that. This bird, well, I don't know, he was somehow, he, he I don't I well, I really don't know how he got there, how he got in front of the, of the mirror and doing that. So that was pretty surprising for me. And I still don't know why that happened. Never seen it before, uh, after that, but. Excellent. Um, I have a follow-up question kind of along that same line. When you're out in the field, um, what do you do when you just can't identify a bird? Do you have resources? What do you, what do you carry with you? How do you, what kind of advice can you provide for uh, birders out there? I can add some, give some preliminary advice. Um, th this actually happened to me yesterday. This can also be my interesting bird encounter, but um, if, I if I'm hearing something that I don't know what it is, which is what happened yesterday, um, I usually try to get as close as I can to it. And then with my smartphone, there's an app called the Voice Recorder Pro which is a free app. You can also just use voice memos, if, uh, which is something on iPhone. But if you download this app, you can really simply record what you're hearing. And what I thought I was hearing was a really loud yellow-bellied sap sucker going, yeah, yeah. But it turned out it was a Cooper's hawk. I hunted it down and figured out it was actually a very territorial Cooper's hawk vocalizing. Um, but especially with summer coming on, if you're hearing something, you don't know what it is. Really, the, my, I recommend recording it because it's so hard to describe a call to someone else and then just share it with other people you think might know the answer and bounce it off other people if you have a suspicion and usually get to the bottom of it pretty quickly that way. And um, with something you're looking at that you don't know what it is, um, just the classic of recording field marks you see and behavior and flipping. I mean, when I was first learning a lot of my birds, I was literally just sit on the couch and go page by page by page through the field guide until I saw the page of what I saw, you know, and it takes a lot of time, but in the process, you learn the bird on every single page. And so a manual strategy like that. And then also of course, if you're carrying a camera, do the same thing as you did with recording the bird, but try to take a picture of it and send it around. And you can send it to send it to me if you want. I can help you figure it out. Um, but those two strategies, and then also just familiarizing self, yourself with field guides. And there's also apps out there that um, can serve as field guides as well, though. I still like the paper books myself. Uh, but those are my strategies, which I use all the time. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. The app was called Voice Recorder Pro, which I really like. It's pretty easy. 
Thank you, Alan. All right. If nobody else wants to uh, jump in there, I have a question about how we balance um, technology with traditional methods. So as te technological advances like geo geolocators or GPS tags or nano tags have become available for smaller and smaller species, how do you prioritize straightforward banding efforts with technological tagging efforts, um, considering all factors like costs or effort and data return? Well, just to start off, um, the first thing that we that we are concerned about and the first thing that we're required to be concerned about with our bird banding permits is um, not to encumber birds with anything that's more than about 2% of their weight maximum. And uh, as the questioner is obviously aware, the, the, the weight of a lot of these tracking devices have, have become so much lighter now that an amazing number of rather small birds can be tracked. And that provides astonishing information on where was that bird every day. Perhaps it's a nano tag and we have to go back to the Arctic and we have to catch that same semi-palmated sunpiper on the nest and then download the data because it couldn't carry a, a larger transmitter to a satellite. Um, but also we, we really have to, um, at some point, handle the birds for some of the questions that we're talking about. If I am interested in the progress of molt, which is an important part of renewing the feathers before the bird migrates south, as a northerner right now, um, or if we are looking at weight gains as a means of a bird fueling up for long distance migrations, um, a lot of those data can really only be handled by, only be collected in, in large amounts and after a statistical analysis by, by mass bird, bird ringing, bird banding programs. So I think we're lucky. I think we're living in a wonderful technology age where it's getting easier and easier for some of this. I've heard of people trying to survey breeding birds and doing it just all with automatic recorders now. And I think that technology is coming and getting better. And we won't have to wander through the state forest fighting our way through the scrub oak and holding a clipboard and writing down with a pencil whenever we hear anything we think is 50 meters to the left or right of us. Um, so the, the technology is, is changing rapidly, but there's still a lot to be said for the paper and the pencil and recording your information into, into a recorder and then really places like the bird observatory or places like other of the, the mass banding programs um, collecting large amounts of data that are much more susceptible to statistical analysis. You can't really get huge uh, amounts of data when you've got something as expensive as Brad and Alan putting a, a, a satellite transmitter onto a boomerang out on Cape Cod and watching it fly off down to Brazil or wherever that it happens to be. Thank you, Trevor. Um, so our hour has just flown by today, uh, uh, but I have one last question for our panelists that I think would be a good closer for today's conversation. So what are the best ways that we as the audience member can help birds as they migrate? Um, and I think this might be something that all of you might be able to touch upon and, and give a brief answer in closing. Arnie, do you, were you about to go? Yeah, I thought you were about to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I'll go after you. Yeah, I will just I was just thinking that that from my point of view, and that is that uh, monitoring is what I always do and promote and hope that all, all people do. I think that's that's a pretty much a very important thing, and especially for look focusing on shorebirds. I mean, you have the International Shorebird Survey, but monitoring birds uh, is 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 very very useful. I mean, it gives us a lot of information. Um, and and it, the more people will help with that, the more data we get. I mean, that, that really, I mean, having good pro and big programs, monitoring programs depend so much on volunteers. So it is, it's really important and it will provide us with a lot of information that is normally quite hard to get. If, uh, because monitoring is expensive, you don't have the people because then you will have to go everywhere. You have to, to train people, you have to do everything. So that's the more volunteers you have, the better data you get. And the more data you get, and the better we understand birds and migration. Uh, just to 
piggyback off of uh, Arne's, um, if, uh, if any of you are interested in joining monitoring efforts, uh, we uh, have the International Shorebird Survey, ISS, um, that is a citizen science project that is so useful for, for monitoring shorebirds. And we could always use more folks interested in, in doing that. Um, and hopefully Danielle or Emily can put a link to the ISS um, uh, website. Um, another thing that I would say since Arne sort of took mine, <laughs> I was gonna say monitoring, um, is uh, you know, knowing knowing when the birds that are particularly sensitive are in your area and you know, if it's um, shorebirds, you know, not letting your dog run on uh, off leash and just trying and not getting too close. If you're uh, kayaking, you know, to where birds are resting or feeding, especially on migration, um, just trying to minimize your own uh, and uh, other people's, if you're able to, um, disturbance, uh, especially on migration, they really need every minute they can, they can, to rest and every uh, ounce of food they can get to fly the distances they do, so. I'll go real quick. Um, more from a backyard perspective, I would, I would not underestimate the power of your own yard in supporting migratory songbirds in particular. And I mean, for example, I live in a very urban neighborhood with hardly any front yard or in no backyard really. And I've seen 60, 60 birds in this from our yard basically. And during migration, there's, I mean, I've had oven birds and common yellow throats singing from literally underneath the single bush that's in the, in the side yard. And that the power of planting native vegetation and, and doing the research about the sorts of shrubs you can plant, they're gonna be producing berries in the fall and you know, Manomet has helped lead research that's um, learned that birds do prefer native berries and, and they are more nutritious than a lot of the invasive plants that are also producing berries. And also in the springtime, you know, they're out there eating bugs, so any sort of vegetation. And you can also put out bird feeders in the winter, though those aren't necessarily helping migrants. They can still support birds, of course, but I just would not underestimate even the smallest sliver of green can really support um, a few birds and every bird matters in that regard and it'll make your yard more entertaining. That's definitely something I've learned this year uh, working from home. Marcella. Yeah, I just want to say that I agree a hundred percent with the things that, that were mentioned uh, and uh, I think that I will also say that um, we can help by helping us spreading these messages, like um, help, uh, share with the community, with our friends, with people who is interested or maybe not so much in the conservation and in the migrant birds to uh, things like that. You can get involved in monitoring, you can help in outreach and education activities, you can um, be careful with your own activities and you can definitely help to spread the message. That will be more and more people uh, doing the same thing and helping to the conservation of the birds. Thank you. I just add on the end, if I might, Danielle, um, the, even, even the, the, the smallest area, as Alan says, provides shelter, provides water, provides food for birds. And so uh, whether they're resident species or whether they're a stopover migrant, those are the important things. Anything you can do to increase that. Um, a lot of the problems now are coming from chemicals and we are getting increased use of uh, herbicides and pesticides. And at the same time, agricultural areas are, are increasing and in the number of little hedges that used to be there before. So when you think about the, uh, the insecticides that we all love it when there aren't as many mosquitoes around, that our birds, especially during the breeding season and during the spring migration are feeding on invertebrates. And so uh, regulation of those and sensible use of those makes a whole lot of sense. 
And then just finally, we did a study at Manomet and we, uh, we, we checked what birds were eating and we checked what seeds were passing through the bird. I'll leave it to you to imagine how we, what passed through the bird. Uh, but a good friend of ours at Boston University did a fine study there. And again, we found that the native vegetation, the native seeds and fruits for migrant birds passing through in the fall and fattening up for fall migration were much preferred and were of much better um, calorific value in terms of birds putting on fat for migration, which makes sense because native species have been co-evolving with the birds many, 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 many more years than there have been uh, any people of any sort around in North America. So uh, native vegetation wherever we can. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, all of, thank you to all of our panelists today. Uh, you shared so many great bits of information and insight into birds and their migration, and we really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you in our audience. You, uh, stayed with us a little bit longer today. We appreciate your support of Manama and your interest in all the work that we're doing. And we hope to see you again on another webinar soon. We'll be back here next Wednesday afternoon uh, with Abby Sterling talking about Wilson's Clovers. And there's a link in the chat and you'll find one in your email follow-up. And uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone. <laughs>